Welcome back. Many thanks for staying with us. You're watching Political Spectrum on Spectrum Television. And don't forget, uh, you can follow us uh, for live feeds via our social media platforms by subscribing to our YouTube channel at spectrumtv.ng. You can find that, of course, on our website. It can also be a part of the conversation as well. Uh, towards the end of the program, we'd love to hear from you. Reach out to us on all the contact as displayed on your screen. It's time for us to look at the day's burning stories and we're starting off a bit closer to home. This time we're going to Oro Federal constituency where concerned constituents of the area have petitioned the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, over its failure to conduct by-elections uh, to fill a vacant seat in the House of Representatives months after the death of the previous occupier, uh, the late Right Honorable Nse Ekbeyong. The petition was submitted uh, to the House of Representatives by Barrister Nothian Luke, who is the member uh, representing the Tinan Sidibum and Sidibum Federal Constituency and also doubles as a former speaker of the Kwabam State House of Assembly. In the petition that was signed, uh, the constituents prayed INEC to, or rather prayed the House to prevail on INEC to conduct a by-election uh, to fill the vacant seats. But the 2023 elections are just around the corner, uh, with the National Assembly polls expected to take place on the same date as the presidential election, and candidates from various parties are already gearing up uh, to win over votes to represent oral federal constituency in the House of Representatives, whereas for the last months uh, there's been a vacant seat that actually needed refilling. To help us talk all things through this issue, joining us live on the show this morning is a renowned journalist and founder, uh, New Normal Foundation, Mr. Inabasi Basisuko, joins us live on Political Spectrum. Good morning to you and many thanks for joining us today. Well, good morning, thank you for having me and good morning, Vias. It's a pleasure to have you join us. Um, let's get straight uh, to it. Uh, we're focusing on an issue that you're well grounded with. Uh, INEC's reluctance to conduct by-elections into oral federal constituency. Uh, when the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Peter B, visited a a uh, few weeks back, I had an opportunity of playing host to Honorable Emmanuel, uh, who is the candidate of the Labour Party going into the House of Representatives election for oral federal constituency. And he said it seems to be a matter that's been thrown into the dustbin and he feels it's no more feasible you know, for INEC to conduct the elections with the new one just around the corner. Uh, before we go into all of that, I'd like to first get your thoughts on why you think INEC had that reluctance to conduct this election in spite of the outcry by people from that constituency that there's a vacant seat that actually needs filling up. Um, Raymond, you see, uh, first of all, I'm from Oro, and I am not the spokesman of um, INEC. So I can't really tell you why uh, the INEC have been unable to conduct that election. But you see, from my own observation, I think the petition written by, submitted by um, of to, my, to the best of my knowledge, is the second petition. Mm. There was one that was written by um, Oro Union Abuja branch, which I am aware of and was signed by the Secretary by Mr. Asuko of Noyo. And um, you see, considering um, the date for the general election, which is approximately 45 days from today. Honestly speaking, I doubt if I will be able to conduct a by-election for all for federal constituency because I, I don't see the possibility. Maybe INEC is planning to conduct the election, the by-election after the general election, the 2023 20, 20, 20 general election. Which is also possible. Isn't that likely to lead to litigation and court cases as we know it over the years? There are persons who could be watching uh, this entire process and just waiting for the right time to strike to say, INEC abandoned that seat uh, for a good number of months since the death of the previous lawmaker. They had every opportunity to have conducted that election but choose not to do so, meaning uh, the people of Oral Federal Constituency at the moment do not have a voice speaking for them in the House of Representatives, it goes against every constitutional mandate that has been provided for by the Constitution. Reverend, there are procedures to all this. And um, the law says 90, within 90 days mm. after the seat has been declared vacant, not 90 days after the death of the person, mm. of the lawmaker, of, of the person that was occupying that seat. Now, you and I knew when that seat was declared vacant. 
it was almost 90 days after, or if for no mistake, I know it's exaggerating, almost 90 days after the death of the person. Mm -hmm. So at this point, at that point, you might not really blame INEC. That seat was declared vacant after our Royal Union wrote a petition to the National Assembly, to the best of my knowledge. And then, okay, after the seat was declared vacant, INEC had within 90 days. Like I said, it is only INEC that can tell Nigerians, that can tell the people of Oro why they've been unable to conduct that by-election. And I, I also feel it might also, um, budgetary um, challenges might have contributed to that. I am not speaking for INEC. This is just my own um, personal opinion. Interesting. The, um, the some have also said uh, political leaders from Oro Nation are equally culpable you know, uh, for this because they didn't speak up earlier uh, than they should have, you know, to put pressure on INEC or whichever body is responsible for seeing to the fact that we should have a by-elections conducted. I wouldn't um, do that line because um, before then, even now, immediately after the death, people started raising um, complaints. Someone protested, did a one-man protest in Oyo. Mm. And um, you see, even if the whole oral decide to protest, decide to cry. It all boils down to one thing. When was that seat declared vacant? I am not justifying INEC's um, oh. decision, uh, decision or INEC refusal, um, to, refusing to conduct that election, but when was that seat declared vacant? It was just a few months ago, a few weeks ago. So I still believe INEC will conduct that election. It is their constitutional responsibility. So let's... Um, sit back, continue pushing, and see what will come. Uh, it's interesting when you, you, you seem to be optimistic that some way, somehow, INEC would still because the law says so. that election. Well, so, um, what happens in, in the state where, uh, come February 25, we have another election for the National Assembly, and far eventually, any of the candidates from any of the parties gets to win, that person has a mandate to look forward to from May 29, or in June, in June. when the new session would be uh, opened. And then there's a good chance, as you've said, that perhaps INEC would again call for that by election. So at what stage do we begin to manage having two representatives for one region who are both having legal reasons or backing to say that that seat should actually be theirs? No, we won't be having two um, representatives because the general election, the National Assembly election coming up on the 25th of February, mm. after winning, you will wait for swearing in. The by-election, when you win, but based on what we've seen so far, based on experience, they swear almost immediately. Mm. So we won't be having to... So you, you, you get to fill in that board until, until, until the new June, session is First week of declared. June, when the new section is declared. So that's interesting. I'm sure a lot of persons will be uh, looking out and monitoring this keenly. But i also like to throw this question. I remember uh, when Barrister Luke presented uh, the appeal of uh, the group who actually petitioned the National Assembly on the floor of the House of Reps. Um, questions were asked after that uh, a sitting and posed to him directly and one of the journalists who raised the question said is it because it is oral I mean would we have this scenario play out if it were another federal constituency within the state it's a very sensitive um, issue considering the, the time we are in and the people of oral they've been crying we have been we have been crying um, that we've been marginalized by the state government. And um, at this point, it is not um, the state government issue. It is a national issue. Mm. And I, like you, I, I'm trying not to drag in um, uh, our repre uh, represent uh, representative from Akwai from State into this issue, mm. in as much as the Enough your clue to the, uh, let me let me say this. Enough your clue um, submitted a petition. Now the question is, if um, they've not they didn't submit a petition to him, it obviously means nobody would have uh, raised up this issue. And I still don't want to say it is because it has to do with oral. I am trying to avoid that sentiment. You know, me, I I hardly bring sentiment into issues like this. Okay, if enough your clue did not do it, like if you want to bring in sentiment. If um, a, a, a representative from another federal constituency did not do it because it is our own, we have people there 
we have um, a senator. We are we, we are opportune to have a senator from Moron. Yes, you will say that is not the Senate, but this this politics at the National Assembly is what we call lobbying. How far did our own representative at the, at the Senate lobby for this to to get to the House? Mm. Interesting. Um, let's look at concerns raised by the ordinary person. So before we talk about the gladiators who are scheming, you know, to fill in those vacant seats, um, the ordinary concerns that uh, we've seen are the fact that within this period, um, there's there's a vacant seat to be filled, and year in or months in, months out, uh, allocations by way of uh, constituency allowances and what have you are still coming from the federal coffers to that seat and it begs the question who is actually receiving it or has there been any sort of force where we might not know but then these are questions people are asking because it means that people of oral federal constituency have been denied uh, the benefits that accrue to them not just as a constituency but we're talking about um, a community that produces the goose that lays the golden egg for the country it's something that should have been a priority but it seems to be swept under the carpet. Again, back to the question of whether it's because it is oral. I would say, yes, the people of oral have been denied the opportunity to be represented at the National Assembly, the House of Representatives. But regarding um, the constituency allowances and all that, I think um, an institution like the National Assembly will not mm -hmm. be that careless to be releasing money for or salary for someone that is dead. So I wouldn't say they've been releasing money or someone have been collecting it, but in terms of representation, mm. the people of Oro, they've lost that, no matter how, how you want to look at it. Okay, so let's look at uh, those who have been scheming to fill in the vacant row by later uh, Nsek Bayong. Um, the President General of uh, Oro Union, uh, his Lordship Bishop Etimante, was one of those uh, vying for that position, along with a relative of uh, the late MP. And um, they've both been scheming to, to the best of their abilities uh, in the, for the good part of 2022. And we know it led to some uh, very heated debates, even amongst the political stakeholders uh, within our own nation, with some saying maybe some level of sympathy should be shown to the family of the late MP by allowing his brother to complete his tenure. Uh, while others say it's a democratic process, so anyone should be allowed to compete. And also back to the issue of whether the by-elections should actually accommodate other political parties and not just for the PDP. Because it looks like it's been branded as a PDP affair. So we must have someone from the PDP replace a late MP who was also a member of the People's Democratic Party. Um, the both um, aspirant uh, you just mentioned, um, they are related to me, closely related. Interesting. <laughs> and uh, it's, um, it's a very interesting uh, scenario. Mm. But then... I don't believe the position of um, House of Rep or Oral Federal, or federal Constitution should be reduced to a point, a family thing. Mm. It is the right of the younger brother of the late MP to contest. It is, he has a right to contest. It is also the right for, of um, the President General Oral Union to contest. It is a contest. Whoever wins gets it. I won't subscribe to the idea of sidelining or streamlining it to his family. It is not um, something that uh, should be inherited or inherited. I, I, I don't, uh, so when I hear people say, let's streamline it to, let's give it to his younger brother, much as he's good, I know him very well, he's qualified, he's capable. But the idea of streamlining it to his family, as I, I also read some people saying they should even give it to his wife. This is democracy, my brother. Whoever is interested should come and tell the people of Oro what, uh, convince us, tell us why we should send you there, rather than streamlining it to a family. And then this issue of whether it is just a PDP thing, I believe it's also part of the reasons why we are here, why this election might have taken and uh, got into this one. Because some persons that should have, um, should have um, come out to speak for Oro regarding this issue, probably because they are not in PDP. Probably because they don't have interest in it. That's another thing that's playing out. All the cries you hear, people co talking about this um, by election, majority of them is circled around personal interest, not for the interest of Oro. Mm. Yes, I just I will say this. Majority of those take a look of those, uh, take a look of those clamoring for the by election. Either your personal interest or the interest of somebody that you will benefit from directly or indirectly. 
only few, only few are agitating for this, for the interest of all. And that is why most people, if you, if you also observe, most people decided to take the back seats and observe. Because they feel it's a PDP thing. To the best of my knowledge, only one person from a YPP, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> have also indicated interest. But the, the discussion around this is circled around PDP. I also feel that that might be one of the reasons this election have dragged to this point. Because those people that should have come out to say this, to speak, to, to, to push this, they've decided to take the back seat. Hmm. Because they believe, why should I go and push this thing for PDP? Interesting. Um, let's go on now. Uh, a short while ago, you, you talked about uh, you know, concerns by some persons around perceived marginalization of uh, Oro Nation, in quotes, in this poli uh, political scheme of uh, a quagum state. Um, before we come into that, let's look at micro marginalization. Even within Oro Nation, there's still a large debate about who should have uh, been allowed to have a shot at the uh, House of uh, Representatives seat come 2023, and it's just around the corner. The issue of zoning comes in, and we know zoning could be peculiar to political parties and how they wish to operate, yes. Uh, but some would say the fact that uh, Oron, uh, Oro, as it were, is a, a nation with five local governments, and so there should be a gentleman agreement for each local government to take turns in having a shot at the House of Representatives, but it looks like in reality, it's not actually been adhered to. So some local governments, and I'm not going to shy away from this particular discussion, Odunwoka local government precisely is uh, one uh, local government that will come to the front burner. They have complained about not having a chance, you know, to be given a shot at the Federal House. And uh, do you find that actually worrying? Uh, because if you look at the scheme of things now, uh, the person uh, going to represent um, uh, the People's Democratic Party and a few other parties still appear to come from other local government areas, save perhaps the Labour Party, who is fronting someone from the local, local government uh, area. Do you find that disturbing? They say charity begins at home. I always tell, whenever this conversation of marginalization comes up, you know me very well, I always say, how far have we been able to manage the little we have? How far have we, have we been able to, I am from Urumuko and I am from the minority. You know how your people have marginalized, have been marginalizing us in Urumuko. But that is a discussion for another day. You see, if your house is not in order, there is no how you come out um, as a team to fight outside. You must put your house in order first. Back to the 2023, um, zoning arrangement is a very technical issue but i am of the opinion that urunko should have been given the opportunity to produce um a member that will represent oral federal constituency but whichever way you look at it everybody they are right in their own argument some persons are saying oral and urunko they share one state uh, state constituency so whichever way um, it goes from there. It is fine. They are right to an extent. But if we want to go by equity as it should be, you see, nobody, to the best of my knowledge, there was never a time everybody sat down and said they want zoning in, in our federal constituency. But somehow, nature on its own created this zoning arrangement. From Urefu Morugo to Okobo to Umbo, remaining Oro Urumuko. And some of us, those of us that we are agitating for Urumuko to produce um, the member representing the next member representing our federal constituency, we we had some reasons, good reasons. But then this politics, this democracy, um, it is uh, power is not uh, given. You fight for it. Uh, Martin Zessen in PDP fought for it. It was a tough fight. To the best of my knowledge, I keep saying it, that is the best primaries I've ever seen, primary election I've ever seen so far. It was a tough contest between Martins and, um, what's his name again, on off York. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, on off York. It was tough. You saw the margin, the very slim margin that uh, margin used to defeat the other guy. It is politics. So many interests played out. But when, when at the end of the day, you end up having disgruntled members, maybe of the political party, 
or the I, community, it doesn't help the purpose I, of I, uniting everyone I, together. Rather than, blaming, rather than blaming the people of Oro, I blame the party. You see, there is this um, mindset, I was discussing with somebody yesterday, there is this thing that when it favors you, we, we, we drop zoning. Mm. When it doesn't favor you, we discuss zoning. In some other federal constituencies across the state, we saw situations where they dropped zoning to pick other persons. Probably because someone's interests need, um, needed to be protected. I don't know, but probably. Now, when it, gets, when it got to the turn, turn of Oro Urumoko, a particular party threw it open. A particular party threw it open, Oro Urumoko. It was left open. Despite the fact that the people of Urumoko wrote to the party, stated reasons why they should go, a particular political party threw it open in their in their in-house zoning they released. They stated it there, Oro Urumoko. I have a copy of it. It's online. It's Oro Why in some federal constituencies, zoning, were, zoning was dropped to favor some persons. It's a party thing. In this case, uh, don't you think throwing it open was also done to equally favor uh, the ambitions of others? I'm looking at the permutations here. Um, like you said rightly, Oro Oduoko share the same constituency in the State House of Assembly. And over the years, there seemed to be that agreement that they both take turns for some political offices, especially in the State House of Assembly. I'm quite aware of uh, an eight years of uh, Jeremy Sadagi. And then there's another eight years about to be completed by um, Efion Bassi. And then going forward again, uh, the current flag bearer for the PDP, and to the best of my knowledge, other political parties, seem to be from Odumoko as well. Now, that understanding is there, but at the national front, that's where the major issue of marginalization comes in here. Yeah. And I want us to juxtapose the oral case to what Ikorekwane Senatorial District had when former Governor Gosel Okwabe was about to leave in office when it seemed like the permutation denied a back state constituency, for instance, from producing a senator, and they were compensated with a position of deputy governor. Um, the People's Democratic Party currently has a deputy gubernatorial candidate who comes from Oron local government. And so some have said, if Oron is having this share of uh, someone going to become a deputy governor, likely, and then the position of Senate is also currently being enjoyed by Oron as well. So why didn't they possibly consider allowing someone from Odumoko to also have a shot at the House of Representatives? So it looks like throwing it open was also done to benefit some people. You see, when some people, uh, when some persons from Oro were saying that um, Odumoko cannot occupy the two positions, State House and mm. Federal and House of Reps, and um, some other persons were like, and some of us told them, you, to, to the best of my knowledge, Oro has occupied the senatorial seat for almost eight years now. Mm -hmm. If you're saying they are both constituency, Oro or Urumuko, why didn't Oro do one four years and hand, and hand over the second four years to Urumuko? Since you're saying uh, Oro or Urumuko, they have one state constituency, then the senatorial position was also given to a particular state constituency, if you want to go by that. Analogy. Why didn't they give Urumoko the second or the first? They did the two. Um, Nelson Nefiong did the first four years and handed over to Senator Akon from the same Oron. And some other persons from Oron too are saying Oron cannot be empty. My brother, Urumoko have been empty for as long as I know. Urumoko has been empty. The last time we had someone there was Jerome, eight years ago. Okay, we shared the same constituency. Since 2015, Oron has produced the commissioner for that constituency. Why didn't they say, okay, do four years and give Urumoko four years? It took a protest for Oro to get for uh, the only essay from Urumoko to be elevated to SSA in 2017, which you are aware of. It took a process, a protest, before the governor invited some few persons and decided to promote, let me use that word, promote the guy from SSA, Wilson on Ophio, mm. from, from SA to SSA, as of 2017. Meanwhile, today, Oron, the people of Oron local government are saying, if they give Oron, since the state house, which is um, statutorily, which statutorily belongs to Urumuko, is going to Urumuko, giving Urumuko 
they are the, the house of reps will make oral remain empty according to them and when i when i hear this uh, such analogy i'm like where were you guys who have been empty since 2015. no state house member the senate is with people the commissioner is with oral almost everything is in oral and now you're saying giving Urumuk a house of reps and uh, you don't use what belongs to me. We, okay, there are, there are two things to be shared. One, statutory belongs to me, is my right, is my own. And then the other one, nature also somehow has also made it to favor me. And you're saying because I have my own, I should neglect the other one that ordinarily should have also come to me. It makes no sense. Meanwhile, you have before now before these things came to me you've 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 you you were with them you were the one holding them up nobody complained and when you talk about the party throwing it open for interest well i won't rule out that um fact but then when you take a second look at the contest did the party actually threw that open for a particular interest? No, the, the, the analogy seems perfect, but um, taking you up on your words when you said earlier that it's democracy, you actually fight for power, it's not given to you. So it seems to me like uh, the stakeholders uh, from uh, the Oron axis, so to say, have actually, you know, stood tall uh, above others by fighting for this and eventually getting it. So what about those from the Udumoko enclave. Uh, I'm also going to push this to you directly as uh, a former aspirant uh, from Udumoko Local Government uh, Council. You've had an opportunity to be in a meeting uh, with the governor of the state's governing manual. And I like to believe that that was a perfect opportunity to also push forward your claims. At what point did those of you from Udumoko extraction also complain to not just the governor, but someone who is the leader of the party that there are things within the Oron Udumoko axis that are not going the way they should? But did you push that to him? I think Udumoko lost that because they, didn't, they pushed, but they didn't come as a team to push. It was individual those that have felt I'm aware you all had a meeting with His Excellency the Governor. No, you were part of that meeting. That, that meeting was as far back as 2017, mm. not recently. So uh, that meeting has nothing to do with this. Uh, it, it, it may not have to do something with these elections directly, but it was an opportunity to also lay bare before it, the Governor it, it, that these were the intricacies affecting the Oro Uduko uh, uh, relationship. Remember, so it, it, is, it is one meeting I hate discussing. I don't want to talk about that meeting. Mm. And that was why I said, Urumuko shot themselves. Because if even at the primaries, Oro uh, presented about a candidate, just one. Urumuko, we had Godwin Oponum, we had uh, uh, <coughs> John Ophiok, and one other person, if I'm not mistaken, and, and Kinney Ejubio. In fact, Kinney stepped down a week, a uh, few days to the primaries. If at the initial stage, these guys have come together, came together and decided to produce one person. It would have been a tough one. But uh, uh, the, uh, the Onofiok, uh, what was his name? Victor Onofiok, how is it? Fought that thing alone to have gotten to that point. Imagine if he had other of his brothers from Murumoko supporting him. Interest. The agitation for selfish interest also cost Urumoko that position. Even the leaders from Murumuko, they couldn't come together and um, take a decision because of their own interest. Because of their own interest. Nobody was able to look at Urumuko um, and then by extension, Oro. It was just myself, yourself. So they couldn't agree on something. At some point, they went like, um, like uh, children without parents, the whole aspirant from Urumuko, they troop into the primaries, and you saw the result. If you, if Gordon upon got about 11, 12, 13 votes, if you, if you add that to what um, Onofiok got, he would have won that primaries. Hmm. So you, you're positing that perhaps if both of them had, had some sort of agreement between Fine. each other, it may have helped their cause. It was, it, it was a simple thing. You look at your strength. This is politics. We all know our strength. And uh, an aspirant that will not win the primaries knows. You know you. Most of them know they will not. 95% of them know they will not win. And then, why going to scatter the vote when you know you will not win? It will get to a point in every election 
before the primaries that you will know you will not win. And um, someone like Godwin Oponum had a better um, number of delegates, hearts of delegates that he was in charge of. Why didn't he surrender those delegates to... I wouldn't say why didn't he because I, I, I'm not privy to what the conversation, the negotiations they have. But if he had stepped down for his brother or if the other guy had stepped down, probably they would have... The, the, the difference is not up to 10 from what we heard, from what we were told. It was a tough contest. So I still believe Udunwuko did, did not get that, um, lost that opportunity because the house was divided. Interesting. So um, let's uh, wrap up on the conversation around uh, Oro uh, Nation as a whole. Um, it still boils down to the issue of um, whether uh, the region has been largely marginalized in the scheme of things. You look at the state of development in Oro Nation, uh, let's date it back to 1999, uh, since the advent of democracy in the state. And the so-called uh, triplet uh, stand that the state was set to operate on uh, seems not to have been respected in the course of time with where Oro has been placed as far as uh, governance in a Kwabam state is concerned. So much so uh, that the biggest political position we're about to hold on to is uh, the likely chance of producing a deputy governor at the end of the gubernatorial elections this year. Every party seems to you know, understand to that uh, extent that, yes, let's allow the people of Oro produce a deputy governor because they've never had someone at the helm of affairs in the state. And it's raised a question about whether that is simply enough. I mean, I did mention earlier on, would a goose that lay the golden egg, not just for the state, but for the country as well. But the state of development in Oro Nation is an eyesore and politically as well, we're not still factored in considerably as much as we should. Is that something for us to worry about or should we uh, tag along with those who say, let's give it time, it's a process, eventually someday we'll also have that big seat? To those that say, let's give it time, it's a process, eventually how long? And then um, it's quite unfortunate that since 99, instead of um, going up, Development in order keep um, coming down. It's quite unfortunate. Then when you talk of um, uh, political uh, arrangement by tribal, I am always very careful to go into that such negative. You know, you know that very well. Because whichever way you look at it, some other persons are saying it is by the three senatorial zone. Some persons are saying it was arranged on a tribal that tribal um, arrangement, whichever way. Now, the former one have been um, scattered to senatorial arrangement. Fine, it is the turn of you. That if we were to stick with the senatorial arrangement, it is the turn of you. And uh, the three major parties, in their wisdom, felt, okay, let's give Oro the deputy governor. And I, I believe the issue of Oro is um, the sad one when it comes to development. And I don't know when and how Oro will come out of the current situation it is today. We've had, um, I feel we've been so unfortunate when it comes to representation. We've never, um, when you look at, when you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you run, let me say, when you run, let me use the word S-ray, when you when you when you do a search on um, on uh, members representing other places, and then you you just oppose it with that of those from Moro, you see a very big, a very big um, gap, a very big. The difference is much, and you cannot you cannot politics is politics is um, all about negotiation. You. Some, some people say, a friend of mine, Duncan, say, well, well, now is not telling me that um, you don't fight outside, you find your way inside, which is, which is um, at this point, which is what Oro should do. Because looking at it in terms of um, numbers, we don't have it. In no, well, th those who have managed to get their way inside and should have supposedly fought from the inside for the benefit of the people of Oro. Well, it seems to me like most of them go in there and they simply tag along 
with the system that they meet on ground, forgetting the mandate that was handed to them by their own people. Not it seem to you. Most, they go in there and tag along with the system. If you ask them, they will tell you that is the only way to, to be relevant in the system. And remember earlier I said it is just for selfish reasons. Only few, only few persons, only few. They go in there two, three years, you see them buy land, build houses. Okay, take for instance, Urumuko, where you and I um, come from. The money they have, um, they have been allocated to Urumuko local government since 1996 eh? is what is on ground including landed properties and uh, structures in Urumuko is nowhere near what they've gotten as allocation. If you want to, if you want to, let's see, let's assume you're selling everything in Urumuko, including the houses that are, that are in Urumuko, it's nowhere near what they've gotten as allocation. Now the question is, what is really happening? Someone goes into government, a local government chairman, one, two, three years, he's building houses everywhere, even in his local government, in Urumuko, I am, as I'm talking to you and I'm trying to run a mental uh, picture of where there is a functional health center in Orumoko. I don't know if there is any. The, I'm trying to run the one I know somewhere, the one I have seen. The one I have seen somewhere in uh, Eyepu, in uh, Ediko. <laughs> I wouldn't want, to, <laughs> you wouldn't want to hear what is happening there. Goats are sleeping there. I am from there. I'm from Ediko. The entire three wards of Uruko, there is no, health, no functional health center. You have to drive. Imagine people coming from Urumuko to Oron. Now, you will say, people will say the governor is, has neglected these people. Now, the question is, we have councillors, we have chairmen, we have House of Reps, House of Assembly members, which, who ordinarily will be the people that will take our, we cannot assess the governor. We take our cry to go. Yeah, most of them say they have tried. But in, in, during um, uh, the last administration, we had um, the leader of the house. And the only road in Urumuko was a no go area, even to your own house. The only road in Urumuko was a no go area. Thank God um, governor, the governor don't came in. I don't know. Uh, maybe somehow God touched him. He managed to give us what we have today as a road in Udumuko. And you see people celebrating this in over 26, 27 years of Udumuko. You're having the first road in Udumuko, which is not compare. You can't compare it to the roads, the quality of roads we have in other places. You cannot compare it. And yet people are celebrating. Nobody wants to ask questions. The same people you expect to, to cry for you to ask these questions on your behalf. They are the one rolling our drums to celebrate this. And you only cry. Sometimes you see, that's why most times when I see them crying on social media, I don't go to, I don't go and start telling them, please stop. There's a limit to how far you can beat a man. And you can't be beating someone and ask the person not to cry. Mm -hmm. We've never had it good. By extension, the, the only road to horror from Uyo I've been under construction for almost eight years. And we just move on, move around as if all is well. If you, if you cry, they say you're crying because probably um, some, you're not close to the system or someone you know is not close to the system. Mm. The same people that will also benefit from this cry you're crying, that would have either directly or indirectly pushed you, they will be the one beating you. So um, on the last line on this, this particular discussion, um, it leads to uh, the one big question. Uh, for the first time in a long while, the 2023 elections has been, uh, is being projected to be an election that Nigerians themselves, the voters, would decide, you know, in terms of which way it goes, who gets what, or who gets this. And the message has been on political conscientization of the people. When you go all around the country, there seems to be a reawakening on the part of people to effect a positive change in the course of the polls this year. I wonder, from what you've seen, do you think oral people in general have reached that level where they can say, let's go to the polls and effect a change, regardless of the so-called tradition that has been observed over the years where it seems like people only tilt towards one or two political parties. This time, there's a plethora of parties to choose from, but the question is, have the people's consciousness been awakened to that level where they say enough is enough with bad leadership and let's change things now? I would say no, in oral. 
and I will also say yes. Yes, in a sense that I see the federal, um, the 2023 House of Representative election in other federal countries is going to be a tough one between the three major parties or two, PDP, APC, and all that. Because some persons have already, some persons have come to, to accept the fact that there is an existing zoning arrangement. And one thing about um, the oral people is that somehow they come to respect this zoning. And no matter how powerful you are, you don't just come and say you want to scatter it at the middle of it. You might try and you succeed. But at the end, the people will always put up this, um, um, this force to a kind of defend it. Uh, then no, in the sense that it will go the usual way. How many political parties um, have produced uh, members for the state house? For instance, I, I, I like using Oro Urumuko Federal because that is the one I know very well. How many of them? And then when you look at the caliber of aspirants, how many of them have what it takes to win election? Unfortunately, we will still go back to where we were. We will still end up having even worse than what we have today, considering the caliber of candidates the parties have produced so far. That is, that is the sad reality. We, we only have... I don't want to... I don't, I, 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 I'm trying not to mention people's names. So, but we only have um, just... We have four already in order for that consistency. At the end of 2023, we'll have four, but um, we'll have minus four <laughs> or minus two because of the caliber of persons the party the, the various parties have produced even for the house of reps at least we had good persons that came out to contest the primaries we have strong people with people that understand or people that you feel you feel okay if given this mandate they will speak they will fight for but they didn't get it and that is where why i said no because the people were not the people have not come to that point where they say enough is enough. We are still playing these politics of uh, selfish interest. Everybody wants to look at what they get from this person, not let's go for the best. They, want, they, they are all after what they will get. So I think um, the, issue, the issue of all of that is, is something wow. I, I, I don't really enjoy talking about. Interesting. I, I, I don't because somehow... You, you try not to, not to be seen as um, fighting for someone that, while fighting for the person outside, the person is inside, uh, supporting the person you're fighting for. Mm -hmm. So some of us just feel, well, let's pray. This is Nigeria. Yeah. Let's see how much uh, <laughs> prayers will help uh, well, in this course. Uh, we're going to have to leave that discourse up there. But when we come back from the short break, uh, for the next few minutes, we'll be looking at the second issue of the day, uh, Tinubu's gaffes as far as uh, his uh, public campaigns in the build-up to this year's presidential election is concerned. Chief Whip in the Senate and former uh, Governor of Abia State, Ojuzo Kalu, has accused Nigerians of distorting messages uh, made by the APC presidential candidates. How true are those claims? We'll talk about that for the next few minutes when we come back from this break. Political Spectrum will return. Please stay with us.